Four or five years ago, we were both on the Nami board, and uh, Kevin was vice president, and I was doing policy work with the Policy and Advocacy Committee, and uh, we've seen a lot of changes since then. Yeah. Kevin took under, uh, undertook the awesome and massive job of running an organization that is uh, that is first, first focus at the, at the moment had to be how do we get enough funds to continue running, but also had incredible policy demands and education demands from the affiliates because NAMI Michigan is really in charge of, the, of training uh, our members and engaging in training of our members for uh, the NAMI signature programs. So NAMI Michigan plays a really big role but it's in the background, and we don't often see. We see the work of the affiliates, we don't often see the work of Nami Michigan. I'm not on the board any longer because I timed out, but I'm still doing work with Policy and Advocacy Committee, and I've really appreciated uh, Kevin's hard work and persistence and the ability to balance both policy issues and funding issues to move Nami Michigan to where it is today. So thank you, Kevin, and the mic is yours. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. A little louder? A little bit. Okay. Maybe just move the mic up a little bit. That's what I... That mic's not projecting the room, but the handheld is projecting. The handheld is projecting. Oh, now we're in trouble because I'm terrible with handheld mics. Is that better? Ooh. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's really better. Okay. <laughs> So, <clears throat> excuse me, first of all, good morning to you and thank you so much for having me today. Um, as Mark mentioned, you know, as the state executive director, um, when I s assumed this responsibility a little over two years ago, I thought I knew what I was getting into, but I really didn't. And so, um, one of the things that I've learned over the last two years is that uh, this is a lot more time, has a lot more time demands than I anticipated, but that's not a complaint. That's really a great thing because NAMI is growing, not only in terms of numbers, but in terms of relevance, quite frankly. And we're expanding throughout the state, but the voice of NAMI, which is consistent with our mission statement that says, we will be the voice on mental illness in the state of Michigan. And we're starting to reassume that role. And I'm always a little leery when I say that because it's not because of me. It's really because of the work that's being done in the communities, in affiliates like here in NAMI Washtenaw. Um, only because of the work that you're able to do allows me to, to do what I do. So. I really appreciate um, Mark, Judy, Tyrone, one for inviting me, but also all of the members and really any and everybody who's a part of the mental health community and the mental health movement because this is a movement. When Tyrone contacted me a few months ago and invited me to speak today, uh, again, first of all, I was very pleased to accept the invitation because because my schedule is becoming so demanding, I'm not able to spend as much time visiting affiliates as I'd like to. So this is a real treat and an opportunity for me. Uh, and, and that's why I'm so grateful for being here. But one of the other things that struck me was we, we had a conversation and he said, well, what's the theme? What would you like to talk about? And at the time we were talking about the mental health crisis. And so while mental health care is at a crisis in the U.S. and really around the world, I look at it as an opportunity. And it's an opportunity because with everything we face, with all of the terrible numbers, the fact that 60, over 60 million Americans are affected by mental illness each year, um, suicide being the second leading cause of death among young people, the loss of uh, 22 veterans a day to suicide. Um, with all of those terrible numbers, and I've only been doing this a short period of time, but when I go back and look at 
over the course of my life, I don't recall mental health care getting the attention that it's receiving right now. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. How many NAMI members are in the room, real quickly? So quite a few, okay, great. So I'm, I, I try to be brief and I try not to be redundant, but I wanna go over just a few statistics because I, I think every time I hear them, the enormity always strikes me um, about where we are, what an opportunity we have before us, but how much work we have before. So again, when we look at the fact that 60 million Americans are affected by mental illness on average each year, only about 41% ever receive mental health treatment. What's becoming a growing issue for us in the mental health care uh, advocacy field is also, uh, when we talk about dual diagnosis, substance use disorders where now 20 million American adults uh, are affected by mental health issues, and I'm sorry, while there are 20 million Americans who experience substance use disorder, over 50% of them live with mental health um, disorders. And that, that's an underlying issue. Um, my background is in business, and I spent over almost 20 years at UPS. One of the things that I love about my UPS experience that I bring to this opportunity is UPS is a root cause company and when a package is delivered late to your home UPS does not just try to identify why that one package was delivered late they go back upstream and say why was that package car late why was the truck that it arrived on late why was the train that it was on before that late why was the airplane it was on before that late? Because they try to get to where did we fail? Where, where was the beginning of the problem? And when we talk about issues like substance use disorder, homelessness, uh, high school and college dropout rate, the suicide rate amongst our young people, um, all of those statistics we can back into and realize that for quite a large majority, mental health issues are the underlying cause and so if we're able to address that where we know that for example 90 percent of all persons lost to suicide have underlying mental health conditions that means that 90 percent of those people we lose that 43,000 people we we lose on average each year can be saved and that's my focus i look at not so much how bad it is but here's the opportunity Here's what we can affect. 26% of homelessness have underlying mental health issues. 20% um, of people in our state prisons and 21% 20, in our local jails, mental health issues. 70% of the people, young people in our juvenile justice system have mental health issues. All of this is something that we have an opportunity to affect and make the quality of life better for all of us, not just those of us who are immediately impacted by mental illness, not those, just those of us who've been diagnosed or family members or caregivers. The fact is, every aspect of our life, every part of our community is affected by mental illness because we are all part of the community. We're not the exception. We're part of the community and we need to we need to look at it that way. As we grow, as NAMI grows, it's important that we look outside of what I call the usual suspects. We tend to network with people only within the mental health spectrum. Uh, mental health providers, community mental health, those types of things. But one of the things that we have to do is start to get our places of worship to understand, our schools, private businesses to understand. There's $193 billion in lost wages each year because of the effects of mental illness. It's not just the employee, it's the mom who has to leave because their child is in a mental health crisis in the middle of the day. It's the mom or dad who's at work worrying and not able to, to fulfill their 
uh, potential at work, and I know that's true for me. When my son was diagnosed, my productivity at work suffered. I made myself sick because instead of focusing on the details of my job, I was wondering, where is he? Is he okay? What should I be doing right now to help him? Should I be here at work or should I be with him? And it was a tough decision for me. And for me, like many others, I had to make the tough choice to leave my job to come home and take care of him. Because there came a point where, for a period of time, I had to live with the de making decision of, do I continue to work because I need to work um, to provide him medical insurance? Or is he in such a bad place that basically I need to go home and care for him day to day. And, and many Americans face those, those kinds of challenges. So what's next? And the short answer to me is we continue to move forward. We continue to move forward with the momentum that we're experiencing right now. Right now, there is so much legislation that is all geared toward improving mental health care, access to mental health care, funding for mental health care, eliminating the stigma of mental illness in this country. For me personally, and, and I think it's a, a NAMI thing, stigma continues to be the leading barrier to mental health care in this country. Yes, legislation is important. Yes, funding is important. Yes, access to beds are, is important. But if we don't break the stigma, then people won't come to get the help that they need. And that's where it starts. And quite frankly, that's the least costly investment that we need to make with the greatest return. It is the anti-stigma um, movement. There is lots of legislation. I'm sorry, I said I drift from the mic from time to time. There's so much legislation right now because of, as a result of the work that we are doing together. Uh, Mark mentioned uh, earlier the 298 legislation. And for those who are not familiar with it, um, Section 298 of the governor's proposed 2017 budget suggested, and I'm always, I try to be careful the way I say this because the governor and uh, Nick Lyon over at the department says legally they could not privatize mental health care. That would actually take a change in the law. But substantively, that's what they did. Or that's what was proposed, was to move our community mental health dollars as we know them over to the health plans. Interestingly, and it was just reported in the Crane's uh, D Business Detroit article just yesterday, no one wanted to take credit for who authored that legislation. But Nick Lyon was in Traverse City at the, uh, the Community Mental Health Boards Association conference earlier this week. And Jay Green from Crane's asked, and he finally said it was him. It wasn't the governor. It was he. And I've had this conversation with Nick previously about a month ago uh, where he told me the same. And while I, I'll tell you what his rationale was, how do I say this in public? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that I believe it and I certainly disagree with it. But the rationale was that he didn't feel that the people who run our prepaid inpatient health plans and community mental health offices took seriously their request to reform community mental health care as we know it in the, in the state of Michigan. So he put that strong language in, he said, specifically to force the issue. Now, he also said, in hindsight, he regrets doing it in that manner because it caused an uproar, as you all know, that he had not and the governor had not anticipated. But, you know, again, I, I don't know if that was his real motivation. Again, I personally certainly disagree with that, 
process, but I will agree with him at this point. It did get us here, and I don't have to like the way we arrived, but we're here and we're having this discussion, and this is the largest opportunity for the state of Michigan to improve upon the community mental health system as we know it that we've had in probably the last 30 or 40 years. And that's significant because I'm also a believer that while I didn't believe the current system was broken, it certainly bared improvement. And that's the opportunity before us. And I, 298 has really been all consuming of my time. If I'm not on at least one conference call or in one committee meeting every day, pouring hours into this 298 issue, um, I, I'm, I wouldn't be telling you the truth. But I will tell you this, there is very serious conversation going on right now about how to improve the system and what the system's gonna look like. And I know one of the burning questions you'll have for me later is what's it gonna look like? And today I can't give you an answer. I don't know. I can, I can tell you what direction I think it's going in, but we don't know, the state doesn't know, and the 17 advocates um, that I meet with on a pretty regular basis, uh, we just don't know what the system's gonna look like. So we have 298. We have uh, what's called the, the Mental Health Reform Act, or some people call it the Murphy Bill, or it's actually known as uh, HR Bill 2646, and that's the federal le legislation that's designed to help not only persons living with mental illness, but really offer help to families and caregivers of people who are living with mental illness. Because as we all know, a mental health diagnosis does not, is not just for that one individual. It's not even just for that family. It's for friends and loved ones, or anybody who is trying to help that person improve and maintain their quality of life. And so there's, there's serious legislation in the Senate right now that will help us help others. And we all know lots of people have to take time off work. Um, they have to provide transportation. There's so much that we do that, as Mark mentioned earlier, the health plans would never consider, in the health, in the medical model, as we call it, health plans would never consider things that allow us to improve the quality of life for persons affected by mental illness. It's not just the doctor visits. It's not just did you get your prescription meds. Um, it's all of those things that we can do in the community that will help that person improve a, a quality of life that allows them to maintain a life of dignity, which we are all entitled to. Um, there's also legislation recently, it is going before the House in, in Michigan, uh, and we're hoping that it's voted on before the end of this year, but improvements to Kevin's Law, or uh, what's also called AOT, or Assisted Outpatient Treatment. And, you know, I have people who call me often and, and they oppose AOT, and here's, here's my response. First of all, when, and, and, and I have to, acknowledge and congratulate uh, Judge Mack and Lieutenant Governor Kelly for their work on this issue because it's an important issue. And Kevin's Law, or AOT, is not designed to take the rights of any person away, but it is designed to give them that push that they need to continue to participate in their treatment plan if they're unable to come to that conclusion themselves. And again, as much as we want to protect the rights of the individuals, we also need to protect the rights of the community at large. And there are some of us who are not able to continue to participate in our treatment plan, and we potentially become a danger to ourselves or others. And we have a responsibility to protect the community at large as well. The governor was just, I'm sorry, the Lieutenant Governor Callie was just successful in moving the seclusion and restraint legislation forward. That affects us too. It's not just for persons with developmental disabilities, but mental health disabilities at all, as well. And it's really interesting to me because when you really look at what's happening in some of our schools, and as I've traveled across the state, I've just recently I've seen cases 
in two different school districts where children are being abused and they're being abused in ways that we are not, we're not even allowed to treat prisoners that way. But it's happening to our children because they don't fit the norm or because a teacher maybe has lost their patience with that student. And our children deserve our protections. So again, um, I, I have to uh, acknowledge Governor Cowley's work in, in that area. And then something interesting I noticed even when I was in West Michigan recently is there are communities that have mental health millages on the ballot. That to me again shows how far we're, we've come and how fo forward we're moving when we talk about mental health care in this country because you don't see that everywhere. And our voices are being heard. I've never been prouder of the community at large and NAMI members, and I have to, I have to shout out NAMI Washtenaw members in particular, as when public hearings were held in Lansing uh, earlier this year over the 298 legislation. Um, NAMI Washtenaw members sat in the front row and had their NAMI t-shirts on, and it was a very long day, a lot of testimony, and the chair actually stopped and took out of order. He said, I have to acknowledge this group in the front row with the colorful shirts. Come forward and be heard. And I will tell you, I meet with legislators all the time. And, and again, I know Mark was there. There were over 300 people who appeared in Lansing that day to give public testimony. And they said that is unheard of. They actually had to have two holding rooms for people to come and speak. And it got to a, a point at the end of the day where one of the members just put her hands up and she said, enough. Let's just vote on this right now because this, this language is going nowhere. And that speaks to the power of the voice of advocacy. A lot of people don't think their voice matters. It does, and that was a tremendous display of that. So, so how do we move forward? What's next for us? For me, it's collaboration. There is power in not only myself as an individual, you as an individual advocating for yourself or loved ones, but when we collaborate, we are stronger. And what I have heard from Nick Lyon at the Department of Health and Human Services, what I've heard from the Lieutenant Governor, what I've even heard from my friends uh, Rick Murdoch over at the health plans is they don't recall a time when the mental health community united and collaborated to fight such legislation. You all may uh, be aware of a couple of months ago the, the advocates walked out of a 298 meeting about two months ago uh, with the department. And quite frankly, the person who was running that meeting didn't think that was very significant until we all started getting calls from the lieutenant governor at 11.30 at night begging us to come back to the table. That's something that has not been heard of in quite some time in the mental health community. And again, that speaks to the power of collaboration and us remaining united in these issues. There's no perfect legislation. Uh, when we talk about the Murphy Bill, when we talk about Kevin's Law, um, there's no perfect legislation. But what we need to do is determine what looks right, what can we win today, take that and move forward and say, I can win this battle today. I couldn't get everything I wanted, but I can get two of the five. So I'll take those two. And once I have those secure, then I'll go after the other three. And I think it's really important that we do that because I started saying earlier, see, this is why I have these slides to kind of keep me on track. Uh, I started saying earlier, I have people who call my office who say, well, I don't agree with everything that's in the Murphy Bill, or I don't agree with everything that's in Kevin's Law. And I said, we don't need to agree with all of it. We need to be able to agree with the majority of it. And we have to search our souls. We have to search our conscience and make sure that we're okay with that. But we take what we can get and we move forward.
I like to also go back, um, one of the analogies that I like to use is look at how far the LGBTQ community has come in the last five, six years. You don't have to, the issue is not whether or not you agree at all, but look at what that movement has done. In five years or less, you've gone from being ostracized if you were a member of that community to being ostracized if you say anything negative about the community. And that was the power of unity and taking a stand and saying, and don't get me wrong, and, and I don't want to diminish that struggle because that struggle's gone on for many, many years, but it seems like a stake was put in the ground five or six years ago, and they said, we're gonna go for it right now, and we're successful. And we need to do the same thing when we look at mental health legislation. Our stake is in the ground. There's never been a better time in recent years than right now for us to push mental health legislation through and have a real effect on the improvement of quality of life for everybody in our community. So I'm very proud that NAMI really has a seat at the table. And, and again, I know we're primarily NAMI members, but for even those who are not, join us because we need you. NAMI has a seat at the table and it's a significant seat. The policy work that Mark is doing, um, the work that we're doing in Lansing is significant and it's being heard and citizens, legislators, many leaders across the communities are reaching out to our offices and saying, where is NAMI on this issue? Because we want to know and we value your opinion and we want to move forward with you. So the advocacy work we do is incredibly, incredibly important. Again, many of you are, are, are NAMI members, so as we move forward, I think it's, it's incredibly important that we continue to strengthen the NAMI pro signature programs and continue to grow and develop and offer those in our communities. Um, there are many, we have many programs, but I'll call out a few that I think are very significant and because they affect our young people. We all know that 75% of all lifetime cases of mental illness onset by the age of 24, 50% onset by the age of 14. So there's this sweet spot, uh, for lack of a better term, and I see it as an opportunity for us to connect in our schools. And I know Allison Payne and many others in the room are very, in, and Bob Nassauer, who I don't see, but I know he's around here, very involved in our Ending to Silence programs and Parents and Teachers as Allies programs because that gets us into the community where we really need to be. The other place that I think we can make huge inroads is in our places of worship. Regardless as to your religious affiliation, most of us in time of crisis go to our faith leaders for help. And I call upon our faith leaders to understand respectfully that they're not mental health care experts. And we're not asking them to. NAMI FaithNet and many other programs offer them the opportunity to simply acknowledge the fact first that faith is a part of recovery. And I was having a conversation with a gentleman in the governor's office yesterday about this. Faith is a part of your recovery if, that, if you are a faithful person. And that needs to be acknowledged and our places of worship need to help their members understand that mental illness is not a sin, it's not a punishment, it's a medical diagnosis like anything else. Uh, I was talking to a pastor about this recently and I said, if you were to experience a heart attack right now, what would you want me to do? Yes, you would want me to pray for you. But I bet you want me to pick up the phone and call an ambulance. <laughs> Tell your members the same thing. Faith leaders ask me all the, th all the time, what's the one thing that I can do? Stand in your pulpit or whatever you call it in your place of worship and let, in, in just two minutes, I'm not asking you to give a whole sermon, two minutes, acknowledge to your members that mental illness is a serious medical condition and that it is okay to seek mental health care, just as you would for any other physical ailment. 
They would do wonders for their membership if they would do that. The other NAMI program I want to call out, and I know Mark has been a leader on this for many, many years, is the NAMI Smarts program. NAMI Smarts is very simply is a program that helps educate everyday people like you and I on how to be better advocates, how to uh, communicate our message to legislators in a very short, clean process where they will listen to us because legislators are very busy. They don't want the long-winded story like I would present. Um, they need it in a very succinct manner. And NAMI Smarts is a great program for that and it is underutilized. It is a program that NAMI Washtenaw is very um, blessed to be taking advantage of, but many of our other affiliates don't. And that's a program that we really need to, uh, to get back out there in the communities and have people trained and, and able to take advantage of that. The other thing that I want to talk about, and, is, and, and it, it tends to be a little bit of a touchy subject, but one that is, I think is not only important to me, I think it's important to all of us. And it's kind of a term that we're not used to hearing, but we need to protect our brand. NAMI is a brand. Just like McDonald's or Nike, NAMI is a brand. The difference is, it's in the product or the services that we provide. And I'm concerned about that because as we are becoming better known, stronger in the community, I see opportunities for our brand to be damaged. And my responsibility <clears throat> here at the state, and I have this conversation uh, nationally with Mary Gilliberti and mil many other people, is it's our responsibility to protect the brand. And there's a couple ways that we do that. First is, as we are introducing NAMI programming in our community, it is extremely important that we follow those programs as they're written. And, and the reason for that is federal dollars are becoming more and more difficult to get. And the buzzword now is, uh, and I just lost the term, I knew I was gonna say it, evidence-based. All of your practices, if you wanna seek uh, state and federal grants, you have to have evidence-based programming. And in order to maintain, first of all, to establish evidence-based programming and to maintain it, we have to follow it as it's written. The other item that I'm becoming very concerned about is outside entities using the NAMI brand. We have people who are not NAMI members, not affiliated with NAMI, calling themselves NAMI. And that is something that I'm very, very concerned about. Um, that's something that nas our national office is very concerned about. And that's why we're going through this, what we call reaffiliation process, is because it, we will ensure first that our local affiliates protect themselves um, in terms of things like having adequate insurance and those kinds of things, but also making sure that we are in the community offering NAMI education support and advocacy in the manner that the national office and, our, and consistent with our mission. It's a, it's a difficult conversation to have sometimes because I end up saying at the end of the day, I use the analogy like McDonald's. If you're McDonald's franchisee, the Big Mac, to all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, right? <laughs> if I buy a McDonald's franchise, I can't decide, you know what, I don't like the special sauce. So I'm gonna use barbecue sauce, or I'm gonna use ketchup. That's the way, or the analogy that I, I like to use with NAMI programming. If we, if we think that there's a better way to do it, then it's incumbent upon us, and there's a process for us to make recommendations to our national office to improve programming. And they do that. They review programs on a very regular basis. But it's, it's very important that we protect the brand right now because going forward, we have a voice. And that voice is valued, and we don't want that voice to be diminished because either it's not being properly used or it's being used by someone not authorized to use it. 
And lastly, I simply want to say I thank all of you for the support of NAMI. I thank all of you for what you do to support persons whose lives are affected by mental illness. But mostly, I want you to remember my message is that we are better together. We are better united. We have a larger voice together. And together, we're going to do great things. So thank you for having me today. Um, I will, if we have a few minutes, I can take a couple of questions. She has a teen pregnancy program that she's offering to the community and others, and she's doing it under the name of NAMI. That damages our brain, and that we have to protect against. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, could you go into detail about your concerns about evidence-based uh, practices? Uh, well, uh, I think what I mentioned earlier, my concern is we need to make we need to establish and maintain, for example, and I'll use uh, my friend Allison Payne as an example again. Allison is very involved in the community and does a lot of our Ending the Silence presentations, which is an anti-stigma program to high school students. That program is currently being evaluated to become an evidence-based program. Right now, so I'll go back maybe six months. I had a meeting with the Michigan Department of Education seeking a grant so we could expand the program. But when they found out it wasn't evidence-based, they said, unfortunately, we can't offer you those dollars. However, when it does achieve evidence-based status, come back to us. So that's what's really important now is that it's established. And then once we establish it, we have to maintain it. And when I say maintain it is, we can't deviate from it. Um, because one of the questions that came up, and it's been, here's one of the challenges, Allison, and we face with this program. And, and again, fortunately here in Army Washington, which is, is an, an exceptional affiliate, you have young people who participate. Part of the Ending the Silence presentation requires that we have a young person, typically 25 years old or younger, who go with a facilitator like Allison into a school because the question and answer exchange, it, we found out, is really the most valuable part of that program. And, but it's very difficult to get young people to do that. So the question became, well, it would be easier if we could just take a videotape or if we could do it via Skype or somehow remote. And when we asked the question of National, they said no, one, because it's not a part of what we've submitted in the study to achieve the evidence-based status. But the other part is, if we take, if we remove that component, we really remove the most effective part of the program. So we, even though it would be more convenient to us, 
we can't do it because we, we risk our status at that point. And can you describe the process to become, to get that evidence-based designation? You know, I would love to, but I'm not qualified <laughs> because I've heard several versions. Mark, did you know? Yeah. I'll let Mark take that one. He's, a, he's an educator. <laughs> well, I, I, you have to have uh, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the evidence base is um, awarded uh, by certain people like SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, who reviews studies that are done by independent people, typically universities, using following certain protocols. And the highest level of protocol is the um, um, semi uh, 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 experimental design where you have a control group or comparison group and an experimental group. And you compare the two and you determine whether there's been change at a certain level of statistical significance. So it has to do with that level of information. Um, it, they also allow uh, other kinds of testimony by experts who observe things and who don't, where you don't have that level, because some studies you cannot have that level of, of experimental design. They simply will not. Uh, fit. So you have other levels of testimony and articles that are written, but they're usually by experts who will, um, uh, and, and, done, and reviewed in peer reviewed journals where they appear. So it just can't be somebody who does a study. It, it has to occur in a, in a peer reviewed journal uh, following certain protocols. And you usually you have to have more than one study, uh, two to three studies. Uh, because, you know, uh, as we know from research, one, uh, one study does not necessarily uh, produce it, so uh, you have to have numerous studies. So it takes time, and it's unfortunate that it's that way, but it, it requires, uh, uh, you know, a certain level of confidence that what you're really studying is, has been shown to be true. So it takes time, it, it's not easily done, and um, uh, all the NAMI programs are currently under study. Family to Family has been evidence-based for some time, which is why we have the uh, Medal of Understanding from the Veterans Administration to offer Family to Family uh, to veterans and their families. So it, it's really important. Yeah, two quick things. It takes money to, to do this independent uh, research. Um, if anyone in this room, I, I see an opportunity. If anyone in this room is interested in becoming a young person presenter, please see Allison or myself. Or if you know somebody, we're always looking for uh, new uh, young people presenters because, like Kevin is saying, it's really hard to uh, to find them and, and have them available. So please step forward and, and volunteer. Thanks. And then they grow up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and you know, interestingly, here's one of the things that I respect. You know, I respect people not being comfortable coming out and talking about uh, their mental health diagnosis or experience. But please understand that, and, and I, I would always be respectful of that individual's right, but I also feel compelled to ask that you strongly consider doing it because that's how we move forward. And again, I don't like, um, I don't like, I don't use the term picking on the LGBTQ community, but remember how hard it was for people to come out of the closet. And, and I, I interview, um, there's a gentleman, used to be a, a very popular radio personality in Detroit years ago. He suffered a closed head injury uh, in a, a car accident many years ago and, and has uh, some mental health um, <coughs> uh, issues going forward as a result of that. And while I was on his, uh, doing an interview on his radio show earlier this year, he called, well, he called me up to do the interview. He said, I want to come out of the closet. I want to talk about it. I want to have a difference. I make a difference. We talk all the time about how many celebrities, um, very famous people who run companies, legislators, who live with mental illness, but are afraid to come forward. And again, I respect the individual's right, that is your right, but I also urge you, if you want to be a part of the movement and do that, to please consider doing that. We have time for one more question. Time for one more question. Could you please tell us a little bit more about the federal legislation could, that could give support to caregivers and families? So right now, 
Um, the Murphy Bill has money in it, real <laughs> significant money that would be made available to caregivers for the time that they spend giving care, uh, a lot like peer supports, um, potential mileage reimbursements, those types of things that would help offset some of the costs we incur. Again, that many people don't acknowledge exists. It, take, it costs you money to take time off work. It costs money to drive miles for, uh, to get to doctor's appointments. So it's those kinds of things. There's actually even money for, um, and I can't remember all the details, but there's actually even money for marriage counseling uh, in the bill because we all know, and, and Senator Stabenow has talked publicly many times about the effect that uh, her father's mental illness had on the marriage and the family. So those are things that the traditional medical model wouldn't acknowledge and hasn't been acknowledged really by any legislation over many years, but those are real costs that we incur and a need that needs to be addressed. Yes, ma'am. Um, are you going to help uh, pass a law stating that if you've been unemployed for a long period of time, that they can't look at, the HR can't look at that? Some states have it, Michigan does not. I'm not sure I understand, that's okay. the question. If you've been unemployed for because of your disability mm -hmm. for four or five years mm -hmm. and you're trying to get back in the workforce, you can't get a job. So yeah, right. some states have that now that they can't use that. They can't use it against you. Yes. I'm Michigan not, does not. Michigan does not. I'm not aware of legislation in Michigan to do it, but is is it something that I would support? Yes. The issue, what's really difficult is finding a, le you always have to find a legislator who will sponsor your bill. And that's what's difficult. And uh, I, I met with a group of uh, advocates for the legislator that were trying to get to sponsor the um, common formulary bill. Right now, there are five protected classes of medication of which uh, mental health drugs are a part of. That was a part of a bill passed in 2004, which, for lack of a, that lack of a better term, we don't have to get pre-authorization to get access to those drugs. That legislation for the last couple of years appears to have been, is, to be challenged. And we're trying to get the legislation made permanent where we're protected. The difficulty we're having is finding a legislator who says, I will champion that bill for you. So, would I? Yes, but there's nothing there. Now. You cannot go better until you get a job. Oh, of course. And Agreed. that's what um, now you have to think would back that. Absolutely. Because the lieutenant governor also had his own disability. Let's talk about this. I'll, I'll be talking with you later. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks. Thank you for your time.